definition actually, they mean a lot of things. What I'm going to talk about here is this kind of client service model where something like the Twitter API, you can have a client goes to the Twitter and says, what are the most recent tweets to my account or something like that, and then you get a response back. And so uh, this is some API service provided by someone and you can integrate with it as the client however you like. That's the kind of definition I'm going to use for this talk. And a quick example for anyone that you know, is still a bit unclear, here's about four lines of Python code where you can query the Wikipedia page view API and get back on the topic of machine learning. A surprisingly small number of page views over this January, but uh, nonetheless, this very simple four line request gives you some interesting data to work with. Um, some of the quick technical mentions, I won't go into these terminologies and things, but if you want to be working with APIs, and ultimately you will be if you're doing anything in or around data science, you're going to need to know about these kind of terms and technologies. I'll put my slides online as well if I'm going too fast. But um, the only one I really want to point out is JSON and XML. XML is falling out of fashion. JSON is just a format. Uh, it's actually, oh no, not quite like this. We'll see some JSON later, but it's a format for how applications can communicate in a nice serialized fashion and everyone can have a common data exchange. So what's great about APIs? Um, the first thing I really like is that there's a separation of concerns. If I build an API and I say I do some service like facial recognition, all I have to do is accept images and draw boxes around them. I don't have to worry about you know, whether the image is in the right format per se. If I say I accept a certain format, I don't have to care if it's licensed. All those things might be provided by another service, um, but the service I create will do one and only one or maybe some small collection of features and it will do them very well. So I can specialize. It also in that way defines very explicit service contracts. So there's not really a question of what team is going to build what part of this. The first step in any API development is defining exactly what the services are and how they'll talk to one another. Um, and at that point, if things have been well designed and there's good you know, project management things in place, teams can go off and create <coughs> silos if they need to and really develop independently. It also provides this common abstraction layer for operational monitoring. Something I hate doing as a data scientist is worrying about um, how is my API going to scale. I'll build it such that I know it will scale, but that might mean that as service demand for it goes up, it has to roll out across a lot more computers, and I'd like someone else who knows that system better to do that for me. I'll build it to elastic scale, but I don't want to monitor it. I don't want to be called in the middle of the night when something's wrong with it or it's under attack. But if I build something common, people don't know, have to know what my service is or how it works. They can just interact with it, and it's very commoditized in that fashion. It also allows for versioning and change management. When you work on big systems, it can be really hard to roll out a change. But with a nice API, if you build in a version to the way you call it, then I can roll out at any time. There's a new version available. I'll maintain both. And the people who consume it can take their sweet time in deciding that they want to upgrade to the latest contract I've uh, put in. You also get a lot of things for free around like buffering and load testing. There's a lot of great tools out there that can say, hammer an API with a million calls a minute to make sure that it stands up well. And since there are these common interfaces and protocols, you can benefit from work done by other people very easily. Um, minimizes the amount of software I have to write as a data scientist. While I don't mind writing software and I've gotten pretty good at it, I really want to work on modeling and problem solving and not like CRUD operations and things like that. So we can leave that to software engineers. I'll work on just one particular piece and all the Authentication, who has access to what, that can be managed by people who know those systems much better than a data scientist probably does. It also allows for the isolation of A-B tests, which are really critical to the success of any data science project. Software is either bug-free or not bug-free in general. If you roll out something that's broken, you know very quickly it's not going to work. If you come up with a new model that has a strategy for, I don't know, how it's going to detect fraud, the fraudsters are constantly trying to outsmart it. If you want to have a new idea about how you should offer discounts or change prices in an e-commerce situation, you won't know immediately the effects of that customer response and that changes over time slowly. So if there's anything at risk, you can do much like Facebook does with rolling out features slowly, expose your new model with that you think is much better to maybe 5% of calls, make sure that your KPIs are still good or hopefully improved, and then switch over more gradually. And doing good API development really makes a lot of those things possible. So, um, the other thing you want to think about is really focus on building an API from day one. If you're going to work for, build your own system or work inside of a company, ultimately for it to be delivered to a production system, it's going to have to run in some fashion like this. So 
starting from first principles, building an API, not saying like, oh, we have a bunch of code in some system that now we have to integrate. We should deployment's done a lot faster. Allows you to even stub out and build maybe a model that's not very good your first attempt, but expose that to the people who have to do the integrations. So those can get worked on while you're improving on the accuracy of the system you're building. Um, so an example I just start with when talking about APIs is spam filtering. I see a lot of young faces out there, so some of you might not be old enough like me to remember how painful spam used to be and how terrible our inboxes used to be. I think nine out of 10 of my emails would be just garbage. And uh, keyword lists were the first idea people had for how to solve this. Let's block anything that looks wrong. Like all these pornographic emails have the word breast in them. Block the word breast in all emails. And then Susan G. Coleman's emails don't get through because there's breast cancer in those. Um, it became very clear very quickly that the data scientist had to solve this problem, and luckily they did. Um, but not every company needed to solve this problem over and over again. We now have a very generalized, commoditized solution. Google and maybe a few other players and people really winning at spam filtering. So there was a time when there were lots of competitive services in the market. They either fell out of fashion or acquired or uh, conglomerated or whatever the case may be to the point where now spam filtering is taken for granted. If you have a proposal for a new startup to do spam filtering, very unlikely you're going to get funded because this is pretty much a solved problem. And because it was solved in such a centralized way, we don't even think about the APIs. They fall behind the scenes. And when you have a strong API like that, you also get some interesting benefits like federation. If there were this collection, as it used to be, of different companies offering spam filtering, they didn't necessarily coordinate. Now with the majority of the world's email running through a couple of finite services, they can see when there's new forms of spam coming out or a broad distributed attack going on. Um, so while we don't think of this as an API necessarily, it's good to kind of think that this is the path things will follow. Newer frontiers. We talked a lot earlier about you know, image recognition type technology. Um, this is a list of things that I see becoming common APIs and services today. Also danger zones to come up with new ideas for if you think you're the next leader in facial recognition. Maybe think again, it's becoming a solved problem unless you've got some special case for it. Um, and I think this list will be old hat in five years, just like my spam filtering example is kind of old hat now. And hopefully we'll have a new iteration of more challenging technologies being solved and exposed via API for us to all easily consume without building them from scratch ourselves. So maybe we'll be the people contributing to those or maybe we'll be the ones consuming them. Which leads us to this question everyone faces when you have to build or solve a hard problem. You want to build, buy, or acquire. So I myself love to build. That's where I've tended to in most of my career. But I have to take nothing for granted that other people are going to try and build the same things. And I have to ask strate strategic questions, especially from a business side. Does it make sense for me to tell my clients that we should invest in some technology when competitive services might be emerging? Maybe if we just wait long enough, instead of spending $200,000 to build a solution, we can spend a penny for 200 service requests using someone's API because they've done that investment. Or if you're going to be the firm or company that does that investment, how do you then solve it in the general case, provide an API for any use to use? Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about ensembling, a technique in machine learning. Broad terminology can cover a lot of different use cases. Essentially, it means when you tie a lot of different types of models or ideas together. Random forest is a good example. It's a collection of many decision trees. There are also more advanced techniques like stacking, which is where you divide up your data sets much like a table validation, but you train individual models, and then you have a meta learner that tries to kind of learn which model is the best model. Similar things can be done with APIs. Uh, I like to describe what I call a two-stage system. Let's say you're building something, and you're aware there's some great third-party service that does something like what you do, but maybe not perfect. Um, should you not use their services and build everything from scratch, or do what I'm proposing works best in a lot of cases where you start consuming that service, you see how good of a job it does, and then you take that output as one of your inputs, and then maybe take a sensitive feature you wouldn't share, some personal information you're protecting from your customers, or something domain-specific that your the third-party service doesn't really cover, or just other features that don't fit into this box and build this second stage model that consumes that service and adds in a little bit of extra stuff. And you're doing machine learning here, consuming the output of that system and your own. And if you did something like this using a technique like logistic regression, what you'd likely end up with is your model that has four features instead of the many features that the primary model has. 
And you get a model of this, you know, being your, your fifth, where that first parameter is probably the most of your weight, that the highest explanatory power for whatever you're trying to detect comes from the great offering you have here. But layering that in with all these other extra features you built in allowed you to make a model that uh, doesn't stand on its own, but stands on the shoulders of a giant and is able to be smarter than that by taking in some specific features you've added. Uh, so let's talk about facial recognition. What if you wanted to include this in some way? Starting from the top down, you can try some of the available services that are out there, like Kairos or Microsoft Cognitive Services, Lambda Labs is another good one, or Google Cloud Vision API. That list could go on and on. Um, if you didn't want to use a third-party service, you could look at libraries like OpenCV or CAFE. The CAFE is an e-learning library, but it has a lot of pre-configured models that are there for you to use transfer learning and things like that. Or if you really think you need to do something super advanced and cutting edge, go read all the latest research paper and build something from scratch. But in the case of something like facial recognition, which I claim is being commoditized, I think this is a big waste of your time. Um, what you really need to do is consume those bigger services which will probably be better than a solution you'd create. And improving all the time from investments those companies are doing trying to compete with each other. Meanwhile, selling you uh, a whole bunch of facial recognition requests at pennies on the dollar or pennies on the thousand, even million requests kind of thing, which is how a lot of these services work. Now, there could be a case when you need to get into facial recognition. Maybe you are working for a company that is in the cosmetics industry or they're you know, industrial-like magic kind of things, and facial recognition doesn't capture that specific use case. Yeah, maybe you need to go and extend the existing technology, but by and large, um, hard problems are being solved by companies that are often deep into these things, and the first step in, in tackling anything like that is really deciding should you consume something that's already out there directly as part of a pipeline, or go try and reinvent the wheel. So I'm going to cover a couple of these, give you guys some sampling of some interesting services I'm aware of and have played with and deployed. So my quick display, disclaimer, I'm going to cover a couple of example cases. I don't work for any of these companies, I'm not endorsing any of these. Some of the services aren't even amazing, so uh, these are just examples of some of the types of things that are out there. Your mileage may vary, and as is always the case, most importantly, the solution you need is very specific to your use case, so you should probably try everything and see what's working best in your specific implementation. Um, let's start with Microsoft Cognitive Services, which I think is really cool. We're going to have another talk about this later. Um, this is a collection of things Microsoft's doing in their sort of new business model. They're going to provide things in vision and audio and APIs that you can consume directly. So um, much of the API memory for uh, a lot of these tasks, you just consume their services. This might be a little hard to read, but this is literally three or four cells out of a Jupyter notebook I created that does some facial recognition work. And it's as simple as the first cell there is all my imports I could have taken out. Then I loaded my keys. Then I put uh, the little header together they require. And the last cell is really doing all the work. Depending on how you want to count it, we've got about, what, 15 lines of code there. Um, and that is calling out to their service sending in an image and saying, where are all the faces in this, and getting a response back. That response comes back very quickly in this format. Um, the image I'll show you in a second, they break out and say if they found three faces, it tells me the location of each of the faces, and they also have some extended features that are kind of cool. You can predict other things about the people, like their gender and maybe their nationality. I just put an age to see what I get now. So in addition to finding a face, it tries to predict age in all these cases, which is a nice kind of added feature that you might not even think to be doing if you were building facial recognition from scratch. Um, and this is the image I tested it on. This is me after a talk I gave in San Jose last year. Uh, for whatever reason, interestingly, they didn't capture uh, this third guy's face. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, penalize them too much because he's on an angle, which is a very hard problem and actually usually gets solved with separate models. Most likely behind the scenes what they're doing here is they've trained a model, the typical one that catches people's faces straight on, and they've probably trained a separate model that catches faces at different rotations and different occlusions and things like that, and they're running them all at once and then aggregating them. So I don't know that they're doing that for sure, probably because my face here is on an angle and they managed to capture it, which is pretty impressive that they got at least one out of the two turned faces. So you're, if you use their service, you're benefiting from all the hard work they've done by building multiple sets of models and aggregating them. And I don't have to worry about whether or not that's taking place. I can just test the service and say, 
in my implementations, I have some faces that are straight on, some are on the side, and at least you know, anecdotally, it's catching a lot of those cases. And by the way, very close to my age, predicted a little bit under. Maybe they do that on purpose to flatter people, I don't know. Um, but uh, smart marketing if it is. Uh, either way, uh, I can't speak to the other gentlemen's ages, but that's anecdotally seems to work kind of well, which is interesting. Um, there's a, a kind of a trend, it hasn't really taken off, but I'm excited about this, what uh, I call algorithmic marketplaces. There are a couple of these. The two I've worked with and know best are Algorithmia and uh, the Mashup Marketplace. These are places that are, you can find free and commercial APIs that people are making readily available. So for one thing, it's a great place to go look and say, can I find an API that solves my problem for me? But it's also potentially a really cool place for you to exhibit your work. Um, you could potentially start a business through Algorithmia. If you come up with some really cool service, offer it there. They provide all the plumbing work. You don't have to worry about API credits or RESTful services. You just give them your model. They obviously take some cut of that, and suddenly you're in business. You can be a one-man shop, a one-woman shop, uh, starting up a little company, making money, charging people for these API requests without having to worry about all the problems we used to have in business, like buying data centers and things like that. Um, but we've also, I know there's a lot of people who are maybe just getting into their careers or just, uh, you know, still finishing up school, thinking about dipping their toe in the water in industry. A great way to get yourself noticed and get over that catch-22 of every job requires experience, but how do you get experience without having a job? Um, stand out to people by trying to set up some cool thing on a platform like Algorithmia. It doesn't have to be wildly successful. If it is, suddenly you're an entrepreneur. If it's not, at least it's something interesting people can interact with, see what you've done, and a good way to exhibit your work in an unusual fashion. I rarely see something like that on a resume, so that would certainly stand out to me. Um, here's an example of one of the algorithmic services I used. It's called the uh, Parsley. Uh, apparently they're using deep learning to do this. What they offer in this service is to pull out a parse tree of the language. So just for a test, this is the request I sent them. Uh, a sentence, I said I want the format back as a tree, and the language I previously specified is interestingly enough, Algorithmia also has other services that do language detection, so if I wanted to, I could have chained these together, first detected the language, then put that as an input here and passed it along, but for simplicity's sake, I did that, and I get back a really nice parse tree, um, and I didn't have to do anything but make an API request, and I've got now what I needed to move along with whatever NLP task I'm going to do. Um, a lot, a cool trend you'll see in a lot of these sites is they provide you the quick start code to get going. This is on every page in Algorithmia, for example. You click the language you want to work with, in this case I clicked R, and it gives you what, five lines and an import saying exactly how to call this API. So you can get up and running really fast with this kind of stuff, and they're really fun too, I think, to just play around with and use for hackathon projects and stuff like that, but also for, good for business applications just as well. Another one I wanted to feature because I interviewed one of their uh, founders on uh, Data Skeptic is Indico. They're a startup in the Boston area. Their moniker is they do machine learning for human use. They're into sentiment and text tagging, language detection. They even have a cool feature uh, I've been playing around with lately uh, that, that tries to specify the political meaning of the document. So if you have some crawler running across the web, you want to say, does this have a political slant to it? And if so, which direction does it go? They're, they built a model that attempts to do that. So obviously if that's an important feature for you, you want to do some validation of their work and, and detect the accuracy on your own corpus, but really interesting place to start before reinventing the wheel and see if they've already done this for you. Um, and uh, so what I did just to give some examples, again the code is available on that GitHub repo if you want. I pulled out the descriptions from some of the blog posts on, on dataskeptic.com. Uh, the post titled Thoughts on Fourier Transformation uh, so if you don't know much about Fourier transformation, that's the FFT algorithm that does, is used in signal processing to convert uh, uh, something commonly in this case. I was using audio signals from the time domain to the frequency domain. So you can guess what that's about a little bit, doing some stuff with audio. These are the most important keywords Indico picked out, and it gave me weights to them. So um, this alone, I don't know if I would go and put that on the page and say these are the important keywords of this document, because they're slightly general in some respect. But I could take this in that two-stage model I was describing and maybe use this as uh, quick inputs to do a lot of the heavy lifting before whatever my actual classification problem might be. Took another post called the Difficulties Finding Scientifically Based Nutrition Data from one of the guest posters on our blog. 
You can guess from the title what that might be about. Here are the keywords they picked out. Um, so again, not the necessarily most groundbreaking summary of, of that document, not that keywords are the intent to give a summary, but great, quick, fast starting place without getting too knee deep into building models from scratch. So some honorable mentions, things that uh, I didn't want to cover due to time constraints. Uh, Google Cloud Platform has a large variety of services, kind of on parity with uh, what Microsoft Cognitive Services is doing. Of course, IBM Watson that we've heard about as well today. Wit.ai is one I don't have much experience with but know about. And uh, to throw in one that's a little different, the DiffBot is interesting. They'll do crawls of the web for you so you don't have to build all your own crawling technology. Um, they'll extract data and they'll do some summarization. There are many, many more of these. Um, I picked up some random ones, not per se an endorsement. Half the fun of this, I think, is when you have a problem searching around and doing your due diligence of finding who offers a service and picking the ones really right for you. But these are some popular ones I know are, are widely out there. So mainly what I say when I ask are the interesting problems being solved by APIs. I'm talking about like data science services, facial recognition. Be very careful about deciding to dedicate yourself to that unless you know you are going to go work for Facebook or someplace like that. It's really at the lead. Uh, get right on the Coons team doing that kind of stuff. Um, starting from scratch, not really advisable as that's been commoditized. There's also data APIs I thought are worth mentioning um, since we're talking so much about APIs. And this, by, I mean, what I mean by that is third-party data integration sources. So a lot of these services that are out there will do things like match on email address. So if you have a big customer database and you'd like to get some extended information, maybe to do segmentation or targeting or stuff like that, you have a limited amount of data, you know about your customers. There are people out there that collect data and try and target and profile people. And you can call their services, say, hey, I have this email address. What can you tell me about the person? They'll give you back some response. A lot of that's demographic data or psychographic data. Um, sometimes uh, switching gears, you can also just get news content if you're looking for something to put on your web page or you're looking for news things because you want to do some interesting extraction work and see if you can apply that somehow to making good stock picks. There are a lot of data services out there. Um, your mileage will vary on how accurate they are, what kind of match rates you see. So the hard part for a data scientist maybe isn't building these types of services, but making sure that the ones you pick are well suited for your problem and that they're giving you accurate answers. Because a problem I can tell you I've had in a lot of those third-party data extension services is the quality is very low in general. There are some probably really good companies in that industry, but a lot of these people that say we do third-party data appends by email address, um, in general the data I find to be a rather low quality from most of the vendors. Um, disclaimer number two, I want to give a quick mention for a project I started called Open House. Um, we're kind of in an alpha stage. Uh, this is our gallery. What we're trying to do is liberate historical home sales data so that people like I was uh, about a year ago in the market to buy a home and totally uh, starve for data because these things are held even though they're publicly available data. It's held behind private paywalls and not readily available. I wasn't able to build a lot of the models I wanted to make predictions, but we're trying to liberate some of that data through crawling and making an easy API. And something I'm pushing for to maybe set a standard with a lot of people like this is doing things where in one click you can quickly go into a programming language of your choice. We've added R so far, so you go to our site. With one data you'll open this site called rfiddle, um, where you can do R in your browser, and it's going to pre-populate a call to our API that has the exact data points you've selected from the site. So um, if you're interested in building your own APIs or wrapping services this way, that's a cool technique that we've had a lot of success with. I uh, recommend people check it out. Um, Similarly, we, if you want to use curl, which is a quick command line based way to access the data, we've made that easy. We want people to be using our data, so a lot of our work is how do we break down the barriers to quick access to it. Um, and that curl request just ends up like this. You call our API, get a lot of data points. Um, similarly, there's a lot of weather APIs out there. No reason to reinvent the wheel on weather. Uh, any type of service you might want or could extend your business with, it's worth going and shopping around and seeing what kind of data services are out there even beyond the modeling stuff. All this ties into a concept you need to be familiar with, which is microservice architecture. More and more this is the way businesses are going. You isolate specific functionalities that need to be done and you do them extremely well. And then different teams will own different parts of that. Um, this is some fictitious example I took from some site. Uh, I guess trying to play off what they presume Uber might be doing. So payments, for example, the same team that does directions need not worry about how the payments work. Some specialized group should uh, handle all that and these things should all talk to each other via API. 
And then we also have that beautiful feature of operations teams can monitor the, the chatter between these APIs, make sure that serve the responses are happening in a very you know, quick amount of time and watch for any latency and things like that. This is how most businesses these days are approaching how they build their systems together. And some of those elements of a good microservice architecture will be data science problems. Uh, as you get into industry, you'll likely find you're expected to build in this fashion to contribute to the business's overall goals. Um, so I'm asking this question, you know, are all the cool problems becoming commoditized? Yes, absolutely they are. But I think that just leaves room for the next stage of even cooler problems to emerge. So uh, I don't know if you know the story of John Henry, I'll skip it, look it up if you don't know it, but he was a guy who was worried about being replaced by machines, which ultimately was the path of history. Um, but probably not. Uh, you will adapt. The technologies I use on a daily basis, things like Spark, the algorithms I use, like XGBoost, none of these things existed when I got my degrees. Um, technology constantly changes, and uh, part of the fun of it, I think, is keeping up with all this stuff going to conferences like this, talking to people who are doing interesting stuff, and knowing what's new and what's um, developing in the world. And if you're working on a really hard problem, uh, think beyond what needs of your immediate business is, because the opportunity exists for you to solve a single hard problem really, really well, and then let that solution you've built become a centerpiece of revenue for your employer. Who knew that the world's largest bookstore would eventually become the world's largest data center? Uh, that sounds like a crackpot idea to me, had you asked me 10, 15 years ago, but nonetheless, that is what Amazon has did, uh, did because they needed to stay up on Black Friday and they needed infinitely scalable computing resources and they were very smart about how they built their technology and then realized, hey, other people can use these same services. So as you get out there in the world and start solving hard problems, keep in mind, you may need to poke the leadership of the company and say, hey, what we've built here solves our problem really well and other people could benefit from that too. And then have the hard discussion of, you know, should that be a trade secret or not? I can go both ways on that, but if there's a hard problem that many people need to solve, in all likelihood, someone else is going to solve it and make it an open API. So that's money you're leaving on the table if your company doesn't want to pursue that. Um, beware, though, uh, an interview I did with uh, Florian Tremier, he put out this interesting paper, Stealing Machine Learning Models via the Cloud that shows that if you're interacting with one of these APIs, you can pretty easily reverse engineer how it was built. So uh, just because you put up an API service and decide to make it closed source that people can't see your code, doesn't mean they can't figure out how it works through enough calls to it. Um, so details on how they did that there, and it's not a perfect approach, but just something to be cognizant of. Um, lastly, kind of my conclusions on these. Third-party services are great in that they're easily swapped out later. So if you're starting on a new project, and you integrate with some other service and it becomes too expensive or not good enough, you want to bring it in-house, it's a simple matter of following the same exact REST protocols and then just flipping the switch one day when you're done or switching from one vendor to another when you're upset by the first vendor if multiple people are willing to build out the same integration. Um, and there's a lot of wins that you can do by starting from day one building service-oriented stuff. And like I said, keep your eye out for how your tools could be advanced into other companies consuming them and how uh, what starts as an interesting internal problem could become a new source of revenue for your employers or maybe your startups or your own companies. Um, so thank you. I left a little time for questions, hopefully. Any questions? Thank you. Enjoy your show. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit, um, like maybe on an example of uh, fraud detection, how you could deploy it with some data residing um, essentially on your consumer, on, your, cust on yeah. your customer side, with you owning the algorithm, like state, stateless state, keeping safe, how, how would you do that? Yeah, great question. So for anyone who didn't hear, it's about how could fraud detection be in a service like this? and specifically around keeping state in a system like that. So fraud detection, we first have to isolate what is the core problem. And there can be some nuances to that, but let's say in general it's a credit card charge that someone is, has put in, they want to make a purchase, they give you their credit card information, and you need to, before you call the payment gateway and ask if the bank will authorize it, you have to decide, does this look like a legitimate transaction? Because if it's a stolen credit card, the uh, com you may be on the line for the chargeback or the loss or things like that. So you'd like to identify something as fraud before trying to put that charge through to save money and save loss and things like that. So 
there's a common set of features that you want to look at for fraud. Um, a lot of this, I'm actually working on a fraud problem right now, so I want to be a little vague, make sure I don't reveal anything that's sort of a, a trade secret there, because as soon as you know how fraud is being detected, the fraudster will try and figure out a way to get around it. But it's no surprise that uh, companies want to look at details of where the location is happening. So if the credit card is registered to someone who lives in South Bend, Indiana, and the IP address is from Mumbai, India, they could be there on vacation, business, they, or otherwise, but that's suspicious. That alone doesn't mean fraud, but it's something that needs to be considered. So uh, the caller, uh, when, if you own the service of fraud detection, you need to specify the feature set you're looking for. IP address would want to be one of these things. So the, the caller should come and say, the charge is this much, they're buying this item, this is their IP address, and whatever other elements you want to have. And behind the scenes, the model that you've built will look at all those things and run through a pretty typical classification problem of labeling that either as fraud or not fraud, and then return either that binary respo response a, a, in a short amount of time, or maybe return some score or some probability or something like that. Uh, which is interesting to talk about fraud specifically because latency is a problem. People don't want to wait and have you know, the spinning wheel for five minutes while you decide. But um, luckily what happens to be true is you kind of get some of this for free. Most models, most machine learning algorithms, or even something more exotic like a partially observable Markov decision process will output. In that case, you would get a finite state machine to describe the policy. In most machine learning models, like let's say random forest, you get this collection of trees. Trees can be parsed in log n time. Usually they're very shallow, they can be parsed in parallel. So you can get millisecond response times because all the hard work was done offline solving this difficult model. And in fact, it, and fraud's a good example of something that's constantly evolving. You can be retraining your model all the time and as soon as you have, that, that can be very resource and computationally expensive, but as soon as you have a new good model, serialize it, push it to the API. And the same um, contract of what's requested and what's returned is the same. Mm -hmm. But so like in that scenario, let's say, you see one transaction and it's five dollars and it maybe doesn't raise the flag. Sure. But then you realize, well, if I just answered yes to thousands of these transactions, with right. us, sort of like on the bank side, let's say you might have had that data, but with this microservices API, how would you deploy that? Right. Yeah, you're asking about state earlier too, and I didn't cover. So yeah, that's a good point. A uh, single charge in a vacuum, probably not suspicious. The same credit card being used every second, you know, across a lot of sites is, is very suspicious. So um, if you are a single e-commerce solution and you built your own fraud detection, all you can see is your charges. If you use a company that aggregates those, like I, I use Stripe on my website, they have some fraud detection built in. And I benefit from the fact that I allow them to do that for me because they have hundreds if not thousands of other merchants. So if fraud is happening across merchants, they're implicitly federating that data. Now they don't see all the charges of the world, so um, the broader a, a reach they can see, the better. Um, interesting things could happen where maybe those banks could all decide to cooperate, come up with some sort of common federated interchange to the benefit of everyone exchanging data about fraud. I don't know that anything like that's going on, but in terms of state, yeah, you should have counters behind the scenes at your API, and maybe the first one you don't see, but uh, you're counting and, and monitoring some sort of time series activity. And, that is one of the inputs that the API caller doesn't send, but you have tied in at the back end. Your question. Okay, thank you, Kyle, for a great speech.